How's it going, everyone? Today we are going to be discussing the kidneys. And so we're going to talk about their role in balancing our water supply inside of our bodies. Um, you know, how they will regulate blood pressure and then ultimately how they get rid of, um, you know, some water and, and some ions and some materials through the urinary system. The kidneys are two very important organs and they are going to help filter the blood and get rid of some ions, some waste products, uh, some water through the urinary system. And so that's going to help balance our uh, H2O, the amount of blood volume, the amount of blood pH, um, the uh, blood pressure. And so the, the kidneys, their filtration is very important when it comes to maintaining uh, you know, volumes and then ion concentrations within our blood. The kidneys are located right outside the abdominal cavity. Um, and they both receive a steady supply of blood flow. Around 20% of our resting cardiac output is delivered to the kidneys, and they are going to be responsible for filtering out that blood and maintaining blood volume and blood pressure. So that's why they're receiving a high amount um, of blood from this renal artery. And so that renal artery is going to branch off into renal arterioles, uh, that blood is filtered, and then whatever's a waste product will be converted into urine, uh, traveling from the kidneys through the ure ureters uh, to the bladder, where it is stored until we excrete out that urine. We've discussed the sections of the kidney in the past, but we have the cortex and the medulla um, of these kidneys. They are going to have their own hormones, which we'll discuss about um, in a little bit, or cells that produce certain hormones. Um, and then we have these actual filtration units here called nephrons. And the nephron is going to be the functional unit of the kidney. So what we see is that blood um, through afferent arterioles are going to come into this renal corpsicle. And then depending on the pressures here, which we'll discuss in a little bit, some of that blood is going to be filtered through this nephron. And a lot of materials will be reabsorbed uh, back into the bloodstream, but some of them will make their way through and then be excreted out of the body. You know, again, the function of the kidneys is to filter this blood. So it's very important that, you know, in order for it to do a proper job and maintain ion levels and pH and all those different things that we supply a lot of blood. Uh, so the renal artery will supply that uh, oxygenated blood to the kidney. Um, that artery will branch out into what's called afferent arterioles. So this is blood heading uh, towards the, the kidney. Um, and then again, and once it reaches that uh, renal corpsicle back here, this glomerulus um, is where that filtration will take place. And then eventually, once that blood is um, passing, then the nephron, it will, it will make its way back to the renal veins. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is a very important part of the nephron because it's where these macula densa cells, which pick up on sodium concentration, interact with the uh, juxtaglomerular cells. And so what's going to happen is they're going to pick up on levels of sodium and if there is excessive sodium um, that is, you know, coming into contact through this distal tubule here, so later on down the nephron, it then is going to send a signal to constrict this arterial, and then less blood flow is going to be uh, supplied to the nephron and then filtered. So basically, you know, by measuring the levels of sodium, um, it's going to dictate how much of the blood is currently being filtered. So let's not be shy. The end product of filtering the blood is urine. So that process goes through a few different steps. Uh, we have the first initial filtration, and then a lot of those products that were filtered originally are going to be absorbed um, or reabsorbed, and then the tubular secretion is going to occur, which is where we get rid of all the things uh, that we don't need back in the bloodstream. So if we looked at a simplified version of this, blood is going to come 
um, down from the renal artery to the afferent arterial of these nephrons, and then some of that blood is going to be filtered, right? And that's uh, going to be that initial filtration that happens at the renal corpsicle. And then those products, some of that water, some of those ions, um, are going to be reabsorbed back into the blood later on um, down the nephron. And then we also have, um, you know, any other leftover uh, things that need to be excreted um, will then will then filter from that bloodstream uh, back into the nephron. And then all those byproducts that are left over, that is going to be our urine. And that's what we are going to get rid of. So first, again, is filtration. And this occurs at the uh, glomerulus and Bo Bowman's capsicle. So the glomerulus is where uh, this arterial is going to be. And then whatever is filtered from the blood to the nephron first enters this Bowman's uh, capsule right here. And so that fluid is filtered um, and then will make its way down through the nephron. Here we could see a look at the renal corpsicle. We're going to see that the membrane here is very porous and it has fenestrations uh, that allow these materials to be filtered from that bloodstream into the nephron. Um, and so, you know, that, that structure, that leakiness is good as far as filtration is concerned because, you know, it's going to allow more things across the membrane actually into that nephron. And what ultimately determines how much blood is filtered by the kidneys is going to come down to pressures. And these should look familiar because we already discussed filtration uh, from the bloodstream to certain cells a few you know chapters ago, a few lectures ago. Uh, but we're going to have you know all these different pressures from the water itself, from the blood plasma itself, and from the proteins within that plasma or in that fluid that are going to oppose each other. And then that difference between those pressures ultimately determines how much is being filtered. We can see here that the pressure that promotes filtration is called glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure. And on the last slide, it mentions um, Bauman's uh, space colloid osmotic pressure, but there aren't any proteins in Bauman's space. So that has a pressure of zero. Um, so I'm not sure if you could really say that pr promotes uh, filtration. So I would just keep it to the glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So that's one um, as the amount of blood comes in here increases. That's more pressure that it's exerting promoting filtration. And the two that oppose this filtration are going to be Bauman's space hydrostatic pressure, so the pressure of the liquid within, and then the plasma colloid osmotic pressure. How much the kidneys filter per minute is called glomerular filtration uh, rate, and so this tells us how well our kidneys are able to function. And so if they're operating healthy, you're going to filter about 180 liters of blood every single day. And so this rate is regulated um, by our nervous system and by hormones. And some actually signals uh, within these cells within the renal system that help uh, dictate this filtration rate. Most of what is being filtered actually gets reabsorbed, 99% of it. Um, and so this is called tubular reabsorption, where most of the things that are filtered are reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Uh, but then also something happens later on down uh, the nephron and later on down the blood pathways. And this is called tubular secretion, where, you know, other materials uh, that weren't filtered in the uh, glomerulus or in the renal corpsicle are then um, going to be transferred from the blood back to distal portions of the nephron um, in order to maintain homeostasis and, and physiology. So for example, it lists here, um, hydrogen, you know, later on down the nephron, this tubular secretion will take it from the bloodstream to the nephron 
um, in order to balance pH. Certain materials are going to be reabsorbed in between cells, and then certain materials will be reabsorbed through cells. So paracellular refers to when that transfer occurs between, and then transcellular when it happens through the cell. So if it's happening through a cell, what you were likely to see is that there are going to be ion pumps. Um, and these pumps use ATP in order to transport things across their membrane. So this is the case uh, with sodium. So when sodium is reabsorbed uh, by these, uh, uh, you know, from the nephron to the bloodstream, there's going to be a hydrolyzation of ATP, and that energy will be used to pump sodium back into our bloodstream. Water is going to be reabsorbed via osmosis, and 80% of it is called obligatory water absorption, uh, which takes place in the proximal tubule and the descending portion of the loop of Henle. Um, and then we have uh, facultative reabsorption, which occurs later on down in the uh, latter parts of the kidney. And this filtration is going to be regulated by a hormone, which we'll be discussing here in a second, called antidiuretic hormone. The proximal tubule is where we'll get most of our reabsorption of water um, and solutes, and it mostly happens through what's called sodium symporters. And so that means that sodium is going to travel in the same direction as these materials um, in order to get it back into the bloodstream. Here we can see an example of one of those. This is called a sodium glucose symporter. And so as sodium um, is, is you know, going from the, the lumen of the nephron into these border cells, these, these proximal tubule cells, uh, what's going to happen is that as sodium travels through, so does glucose. So the movement of this ion allows other materials to go through. So a lot, or actually most of the glucose um, that was originally filtered will be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Um, and that's, you know, the, the urine is a, is a way that the medical field is able to, you know, basically... Uh, monitor the kidney health and, and what's going on inside of the body. And so, for example, if this wasn't occurring, you would have high glucose levels in your urine. And if that um, was occurring, that would tell the physician that something is going wrong um, with this pathway or something else within the renal system. Bicarbonate is actually reabsorbed through a little bit different of a method. What we're going to see is that there is going to be an antiporter between sodium and hydrogen. That means sodium is heading into the cell and then that forces the movement of hydrogen ions out. And so what's going to occur is that when bicarbonate is uh, traveling through the lumen of the nephron, well then that pumping of hydrogen outside of these cells is going to help um, carbonic anhydrase turn it from that bicarbonate and that hydrogen to water and CO2. And then water and CO2, um, as it makes its way through the cell, can be converted back into bicarbonate and hydrogen, similar what we kind of talked about uh, for the cardio a respiratory system, and then that hydrogen, that hydrogen can keep on going down this process and bicarbonate can be reabsorbed. And so this pathway is going to be either turned up or turned down depending on levels of hydrogen within the blood, our blood pH. And so if our blood pH started to get too low, we can increase um, this, you know, this process here that we just talked about because that um, movement of bicarbonate back into the bloodstream is then going to be a buffer. So now bicarbonate in the bloodstream uh, can buffer out hydrogen ions that are accumulating within our circulation. As we make our way to the loop of Henel, uh, we see that we are getting a little bit less of our reabsorption taking place here. We get some more water reabsorption, which take place um, in the descending limb, and then a little bit more um, of ion reabsorption and also bicarbonate. In the early distal tubule, we'll have uh, just movement of sodium and chloride. And in the late distal tubule and collecting duct, um, we have you know some absorption of sodium. Uh, so that's going to go from the nephron to the bloodstream. And then we get secretion um, from the bloodstream 
to the nephron. So, you know, we have a little bit of reabsorption taking place. Um, and then this tubular secretion, which is moving in the other direction. So, um, you know, potassium is being exchanged for sodium, sodium entering the bloodstream, potassium entering the nephron. And then we have some intercalated cells, uh, which are going to, again, manage pH levels, um, you know, by their activity, by that movement of bicarbonate and hydrogen. Antidiuretic hormone is going to be released by our pituitary, and it's going to have an impact on our uh, water reabsorption and thus blood pressure and blood volume. So the name is easy to break down, antidiuretic. Well, diuretic is anything that makes you um, increase urination. So this would prevent that. Uh, the other name for it is called vasopressin. Um, and so whenever antidiuretic hormone is released in you know increasing amounts, it will bind to receptors. And what it leads to is increased reabsorption of water from the nephron back into the blood and thus creating less urine. And what this does is that if we're reabsorbing more water back into the bloodstream, that increases blood volume, correct? Because we're increasing the amount of blood plasma. And then if we increase blood volume, more blood volume within the same vessels, right? The size, you know, those, those, vessels aren't changing, more blood within those vessels means higher blood pressure. There are other hormones also produced by our renal system, which can regulate blood volume and blood pressure. We barely brought this up in the past lectures because again, it's very important when it comes to blood volume and blood pressure. And we're gonna break it down on the next slide, uh, but I want you to really memorize the steps here of this next pathway. It's called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And this is going to be a response when blood volume and blood pressure decreases. And so once that happens, we're going to need to try to build that blood pressure back up. And so by decreasing the amount that's filtered, that blood pressure um, also increases. And then we'll talk about other ways that that's going to help blood pressure as well. Um, but then we'll also, you know, we have other hormones that which regulate the amount of filtration, uh, atrial natriuretic peptide or AM, AMP um, inhibits the reabsorption of sodium. Um, and so that's going to mean that if we're not reabsorbing as much sodium, we're not reabsorbing as much water. We don't reabsorb as much water, we get rid of more water. So that decreases blood volume, it decreases blood pressure. And then parathyroid hormone, uh, we discussed this back in the endocrine chapter, that's going to stimulate the reabsorption of uh, calcium levels within our blood. So let's go through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And remember, what triggers this mechanism, what triggers these events is low blood pressure. So a drop in blood pressure will signal this pathway to occur and the outcome of increasing the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is an increase in blood volume and an increase in blood pressure. And so low blood pressure is picked up by baroreceptors uh, located in these juxtaglomerular cells. And so um, that event, that low pressure that they were sensing is going to lead to the production of what is called renin. And it's an enzyme that will now be um, increasingly circulated throughout the bloodstream. And renin is going to cleave a precursor protein called angiotensinogen produced by the liver. And so when renin comes into more contact now because it's increasing its, its concentrations, it's going to cleave more of this angiotensinogen to create angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 1 is going to be converted into something called angiotensin 2 by an enzyme appropriately named angiotensin converting enzyme. And these enzymes located um, in the lungs and some of the kidneys will make that conversion from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And now the angiotensin 2 is really what's going to help bring blood pressure up and it's going to do, uh, do so through multiple functions. Uh, one, 
angiotensin II increases sympathetic nervous activity. And remember, when we increase sympathetic nervous activity, we increase cardiac output, which will help to raise pressure um, a little bit, but it's also going to lead to vasoconstriction of arterioles, which will increase blood pressure by increasing TPR. Um, in addition to that, it will adjust blood volume um, by, by manipulating the reabsorption of sodium chloride and um, water. And so you're going to see, again, the relationship between water and ions. Um, you know, it's water is going to tend to move in the direction of some of these ions because of those polar uh, charges. And so when sodium is reabsorbed, you see water reabsorbed with it. Um, and when we reabsorb more water, that's more blood plasma, more blood plasma, more blood volume, more blood pressure. Angiotensin II also leads to the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex, and aldosterone has a similar function uh, in the retention of water. And then a, another effect is that increasing concentrations of angiotensin II will increase concentrations of ADH, and that again helps with water reabsorption, thus increasing, increasing blood volume. And so all these events um, will eventually lead to an increase in water reabsorption, helps to increase blood pressure, and an increase in vasoconstriction, sympathetic nervous activity, also helping to increase blood pressure. So a urine analysis is going to look for all these different materials within the urine, albumin, glucose, red blood cells, ketone bodies, and based on these levels within your urine, um, the physician is going to be able to know sort of the status of what is going on. Maybe there is inflammation, uh, maybe there's a problem with filtration. So, you know, all these things in a urine uh, analysis will tell the physician a little bit more um, about maybe certain conditions that are going on. If kidney function is inadequate, it can lead to what's called renal failure. And there's two types, acute renal failure, where just the kidneys stop working all of a sudden, and that can lead to less urine flow. And that's not a good thing because again, that production of urine will help to regulate our blood volume, our blood pressure, our ion levels, our blood pH. Um, getting rid of waste. And so if those things are off, if we start to get more waste products, uh, fluctuations in pH, these can have very negative consequences. And then chronic renal failure is progressive and irreversible decline in kidney function. And this could get so bad to the point where you need kidney dialysis, which is uh, uh, very, expen very expensive and a very um, unfortunate set of circumstances if you progress to that level. Um, and so, you know, again, promoting a healthier lifestyle to prevent this damage. That's what we do. That's what we're here for. Um, and so, you know, these things we want to avoid with, uh, you know, trying to increase physical activity and a, and a healthy, balanced diet. And so once that urine is produced by the kidneys, it will um, then be shuttled from the kidneys down the uterus to supply the bladder um, with that waste product. And so um, you know, this will fill up to a certain point and then that signal will, will reach the brain to get rid of all of this waste product. So that's it for the renal system. In the next lecture, we're going to talk more about that balance of fluid and ion and things like bicarbonate and hydrogen and uh, glucose and why the balance of all these things is so important for our physiology, right? We always want to maintain um, a constant levels of these things to manage our physiology. And so, you know, the lungs, sorry, the kidneys are part of the system, including the lungs, um, and the liver and the gastrointestinal tract and um, all these areas of the body which deal with managing all these waste products. And so, uh, again, these, these organs, they're really important for filtering out all these byproducts, um, you know, and helping to get rid of all these materials that we don't need within our blood and within our bodies. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next lecture.